We are so excited to have today's uh, playwright, Crystal Skillman with us. Crystal is an award-winning playwright and also an ESPA faculty member. Her plays include Geek, Cut, King Kirby, Pulp Verite, Rain and Zoe Save the World, and her play Open debuted last summer with All for One Theater Company in a co-production with The Tank. Her work spans from the stage to comic books to TV, and some of her uh, writing includes Adventure Time and the comic book Eat Fighter, which she wrote with her husband, Fred Van Lenti. And again, on behalf of Primary Stages family, we just thank you for joining us today. And uh, we are so excited to have Crystal with us. Hi, Crystal. Hey, Kelly. Hey, everybody. <laughs> um, uh, out like, there in TV land. I love it. They're in, <laughs> right? Are you folks at home? You can do speaker view or gallery view, uh, toggle, see what you like best. But we're so excited to have you with us, Crystal. And I'm so happy uh, to be here, um, definitely. So many people sent in so many great questions. Wow, cool. That's yeah. Awesome. Let's start at the beginning of your process, uh, especially now when it can be difficult to, you know, dig in and dive deep into our inspiration. How do you start writing? Well, um, more than usual, um, in, uh, because I work on <clears throat> different projects in different stages and different drafts, so I try to kind of have a little war room and stuff. I don't know if you guys can see, but I've got like a bulletin board with like cute cards of where, you know, like kind of my own seasons as it were and kind of each month and um, uh, how it goes. And so typically what I, I normally do is I say, okay, in this day, this draft is due at the end of the week. So I need three hours here tackling either the next pass of it or a scene or addressing some notes from some producers or wherever it's at in those stages. Or sometimes uh, this is a brand new idea. I want to hear it in my TV class uh, or TV group. So then I think, okay, well, that's, let's do that. And it, it gets a little crazy with all the projects. I didn't realize how crazy until the pandemic, I gotta be honest. Um, but, uh, uh, but now because, because waking up, overcoming, you know, feeling, taking in the news um, and, uh, you know, whatever has changed, that is, you know, we're not in control of a lot of things. Um, there's extra, I'm also a slob. I'm pretty open about that. So cleaning is not something uh, I've worked normally into my schedule to this extent. So that's a shift, right? So all the extra little tasks and things and feelings. And if you're on a phone call, right, it's not going to be maybe five minutes. It might be three hours. You know, you don't really know. So um, just, so basically what I, what I'm going to lead you through today is, 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 how I'm doing it. I don't know when the writing chunk will be because it's harder to predict time. Uh, I find that meetings are really easy. Like I feel like if you set up like a three o'clock Zoom with someone, so maybe even something like this, like writing with someone or, you know, you know, you have to walk through an idea with someone or be ready for this meeting. That's all pretty easy. I think it's the tougher task is to carve out your own time in a time where everybody thinks that you have time. But the most interesting thing about time is that time changes and shifts. So I think there's also allowing yourself to be selfish a little and to, to heal yourself and to find that time. So let's say, like this is gonna happen today, actually, I was supposed to get a bit more writing done before the session. It's actually gonna happen after the session and a teacher has to talk to me at two o'clock, which was unexpected. Um, so, um, so really it's gonna be three o'clock. So I think a three hour chunk is always helpful. A one to three, uh, you know, a one to three hour is ideal. And then I'm gonna break down the time for that for a play I'm gonna hear on Friday. And then I'll take a break, probably a happy hour break, and then come back and see where I'm at and, and kind of deal with that. Um, but I also say you can break it down to 20 minute chunks too, if, because this is a chunky time. And so I just think breaking it down to, I have to work out a plot point, just keeping it really specific with the tasks and the time and really um, patting yourself on the back when, for whatever you achieve. Um, and I would say it's equal, like the fiction and the life equal. Like you wipe down that bag of tomatoes, awesome. That's great. You got this plot point figured out or a little bit more, you know, figured out or you did a monologue, great. Like it's, I, I think the checklist is all one and the same now and I, and, and I think they can all be the same value. Um, uh, I find it harder to make it like life is more important than fiction because I think that 
is true, probably, technically, yes. Um, you have to be uh, living to write and so forth. Um, um, but at the same time, uh, we might not feel well and we might have to write. Like, I, I think not writing or at least dreaming and imagining, if you, if you can't literally write, um, crushes the soul. And so I think it's important to, to give the writing as much value as eating, calling your loved ones, um, donating. I think it's just as important. Amazing, amazing. Now, do you have any uh, specific, when you're maybe, you know, in a rut or your, your writing, I don't know, is blocked, uh, a, a way of inspiring the, the writing time? Do you have any like tricks that you use? Yes, I'll be sharing some of those today so we can actually go through them. Oh, um, amazing. But, um, they're, they're specific to this because I think reality is so difficult. Um, so I think there's stages. It's almost like um, I'm thinking about it a little like uh, securing, getting into the airlock before you take off into space. I think there's just more steps now before something that might, you know, because also you probably had a writing routine you kind of settled into. So even if you were, did a 20 minute jog, like maybe you were able to towel off and in 10 minutes be down and writing, maybe because you had been doing like Pac-Man, you had your maze, right? But that maze is gone now. So it takes a little bit more of an adjustment time uh, to get into writing. Totally, totally. I'm finding that myself with like just about any creative or work related thing. That yes, anything you creative. Just need a little time to settle in and uh, get into it. Let's see here. What other questions? I'm just going through the list. You love comic books and have even written some. How does your love of comic books fuel and inform how you write your plays? I think my work, um, I'm, I do dramas. Uh, I mean, they're funny, they're, they're dark uh, humor, but they have a, usually a very specific political point or something meaty in them. Um, and, uh, and even if they get a little bit more out there, like Eat Fighter, they have things like body image and things that I, I think are really meaty subjects, just like maybe with a bit more humor. Um, so I, I really, um, uh, you know the comic books to me are poppy in a way but so it's kind of even if it's a drama i have a heightened sense of naturalism so it is natural but it's a little heightened or theatrical um you know i just uh i have trouble with scenes that are like people just sitting around eating popcorn watching stuff and talking and i actually like viewing that i have trouble writing that because i find it boring um so i like to look at what is real and then what can be happening in a heightened way that's interesting for an audience. Um, um, and when I say theatrical, I still mean Zoom because even this is, is theatrical, it's a, it's a meta space. So I guess because I like the meta space, um, comic books are perfect for me. This is a comic book right now, you know, it's like even the way the panels for me are created, they create tension and um, timing. Um, so scenes and how long they are uh, and push one into the other are very much almost like moments of a, of a comic book. And I do think of it like that, that each moment like pops out in a different way. Um, and sometimes I like that there's one main style in, a, in, in theater or my film work. And then we go into, we pop it out in a different way. This is kind of why I, I'm good for writing for musical theater because typically that's what those songs are is their pop outs. And some of the TV stuff I'm developing involves musicals. So it, it's kind of great because then I don't have to be like, oh, I don't have to be that writer of a searing uh, drama, family drama on uh, TV. Cause that, I just don't think that's, uh, I, I like watching them again. I just, it's just not my, my jam. Yeah, totally, totally. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Thomas wrote in and he he's responding to your reality is hard um, and, and what you're saying about naturalism. So he wants to hear what your strategies and tips might be for writing dialogue and action. Mm. The first thing is that uh, I, I love, di like, di I'm a dialogue junkie, and it's actually one of the reasons why I have trouble reading novels. So I can read novels that have a lot of strong dialogue or have a very strong hero's journey or have animals in them. That's it. So Watership Down, I read every six months. That's my favorite novel. <laughs> there we go. Um, but, uh, but dialogue, as much as we love it, we have to remember, I mean, we polish it, we hone it. it it's what flies and goes back and forth like a trapeze act, like two, two people flipping back and forth, like a tennis game back and forth, right? But the truth is, if it's action is more important. It's from action that the dialogue happens. That doesn't mean you have to know everything that happens, but I would just use this simple trick 
which is that for every new action, there's a new obstacle. For every new obstacle, there's a new action. And this means as you write, you can start to develop the skill that about every page and a half, two pages, three tops maybe, there's a shift of temperature in the room. Something changes, something happens, even if it's hearing a siren out the window, which is a huge thing that's happening for all of us right now. So one could be screaming at someone and that siren, they might suddenly get quiet because they don't feel comfortable sharing the way they were before. And th through that change, the characters will then have a new change of action. And through that, the dialogue comes. And what's helpful with that is that then it's character driven and behavior driven. So it also emphasizes if they don't talk, what's happening, who starts making a sandwich, who starts humming a tune, who turns on the TV, and you could even write what's on the TV if you want, or, you know, I, I you know, what we hear, is it audio? Um, I think it's, so dialogue's incredibly important. I think there's, I love doing a dialogue polish. I do not worry about the dialogue being terrific on the first pass. Sometimes I have on the nose dialogue. You will always find that in the second um, as you dramaturg yourself and reread. So never put the stress on yourself to have perfect crystallized dialogue the first time around. Uh, sometimes that happens. Sometimes it really does. And you look back at that scene, you're like, holy crap, that's amazing. But don't put that pressure on yourself because you're going to know the gem of a line and you're going to be able to craft it and whittle it later. What's more important is to get the flow of it and what's going on with the characters and what they're doing or not doing and how are we not repeating? How are we not staying in the same beat? Because by the beats, um, having new obstacles and new actions introduced, it leads the scene somewhere that ultimately leads to failure because it leads to failure that leads to the next scene. Um, or if you're writing a short play, you have a lot more freedom because you don't, um, the structure is so exciting. I mean, you know, you, you know, you can, have alternative structures and messed up structures that don't have to repeat themselves and audience has to even understand they can just like be a part of for at least i found for myself for an audience for at least 20 to 25 minutes maybe even maybe even 30. i would say beyond that an audience is looking for a theatrical language that they can understand that you can break later but that they have something to hold on to to say oh, okay cool when they look out the window they don't see stuff out the window but they're looking out here at me and there's a tree i get that that's a, a theatrical device i get that this character can talk to the audience i get that this person only sees that person dressed like a bunny rabbit in the corner i get that like you know just the basic rules and all that stuff can shift fairview is a terrific example of a play which actually tells you in the beginning when you read it, it's a really wonderful read. I, a really wonderful read that breaks down kind of how it works, but then even as it's happening, it's shifting before you. And um, so absolutely new things can be introduced, but you know, Fiddler on the Roof is a great example. In the first 20 minutes of Fiddler on the Roof, there is just so much happening. Like if you really break it down, it seems so easy, but it's not. Like this guy's narrating to us, there's a whole village, there's history involved. <laughs> but he has to explain a culture that some people may not even know. Um, until they understood the lyric hook of tradition, it wasn't understandable. So, I mean, it's, it's, but by the first 20 minutes, the theatrical language is set, like, and, uh, and then we can go anywhere from there. And, and including things we didn't expect, like there's this song called Havala in the, later in the play, uh, musical, and it's gorgeous and haunting, and it's totally unexpected, and the way it works is unexpected, and, um, so it's, there's always invention, but that's, that's kind of the way I think about it, and that those scenes are, you know, the little the stones that make that um, house. What, again, whether you want to make something that uh, can sustain itself for 20, 25 minutes, if you're going for something over 30 minutes, I think then you're looking, okay, what does that all add up to um, for an audience? I love that uh, the, the breakdown of the Fiddler on the Roof, the first 20 minutes. I'm going to have to go back so and watch good. it now. <laughs> Oh, it's so well. So now much happens. Now it would be really. It's a really healing thing to watch now. And Passover, I think, is tonight or yeah. just started. Yeah. 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 Amazing. So when you once you get like the first draft, as you said, the dialogue doesn't have to be perfect yet. No. For you, what does the rewriting, editing, whittling, as you said, process look like? Well, yeah, I'm looking for. Um, I, I, the first thing I look for, which is the easiest, and it, but it took time for me to develop this eye and ear, and it's, I'm, I'm looking to cut out the fat. So when I was a younger writer, that was much harder to do, because if you were writing, because everything has history. So kind of the easiest things are where, the easiest scenarios are where no one has history, but that has its own hard road to hoe. 
why do strangers stay in a room together? I mean, that's tough. It's not the easiest thing either. So that also has its own thing. Probably the easiest is two characters in a situation, one really knows it and the other one doesn't because it never feels like fact because the other person needs to know. They're like, wow, this, this grocery store is great. It isn't a grocery store. This is actually, you know, you know, uh, a, a theme park. This is just where they sell the superhero food. Do you know what I mean? Like, so like that like is expositional, but like this person needs to know it. So we don't feel like it's fat. We don't feel like it's exposition and we don't feel like it's extra. Um, and that's just like a little trick, but you can't do that every time. And sometimes you're going to write a play where two sisters haven't seen each other in five years. And how do they not just go, I, when you were five, don't you remember this time? Like, cause it's all in you and their memories are in you. And so how do you stay with the scene and the dramatic action? And I think you're just looking to explore where the character's at um, and what they're trying to do. Um, and, and it's okay if they're not good at it and it's okay if they're just trying. And I think it's important to remember that with character motivation, that characters have a, a deeper motivation that they themselves may not be conscious of, and they, but they are trying to get it. But it's okay to recognize that they may not be conscious of it because in, most, in real life, most of the time we're not. So I think talking about character motivation and looking at that in the scene. So I think that's what a lot of when I'm rereading a scene, that's what I'm looking for is where are they just giving me exposition or information? Often when you cut it out, you'll find that one line becomes more muscular and better dialogue because it's in one line. So even if it's like, I haven't seen you more in a red in a while. What's a while? We don't know. That's evocative. Oh, that's interesting. Like, okay. But it's, it's better than, you know, um, five years ago, you were wearing the same red dress, right? So like, let the audience fill things. And, and, and so when you start to edit on that second pass, you're letting the audience in, you're letting them be there and breathe with the characters. Because the truth is we speak, we don't speak super concisely unless you're a room of academics, which is, is great. Like wit is great because, you know, super, uh, Copenhagen is fascinating because they're all awkward, but they're, they're really good at language as well and describing what they do because they're passionate. So, and you know, if they had to write papers and stuff. So with Niels Bohr and, and Heisenberg. So I think it's just, you know, the truth of, of how they talk and how they operate in the world. That's what I'm looking to capture as much as possible when I relook at a scene. When I look at the scene in context of a full play when I have it, then I'm looking for something in each scene called the turn of a scene. And so there has to be something in the scene that makes the next scene happen. And the, sometimes the best scenes do not have them. And it's really, uh, takes time to, to uh, recognize, but you'll start to recognize it because you'll start to say, well, what actually happened? Oh, wait, but we learned that um, she didn't like the dad. Ooh, ooh, but we learned that in the other scene. Okay. But when we learned that they need to go get the map and go over here, oh, shit. Then the next scene, that could just show them holding the map and like drop them in, right? So like, so sometimes it's easy. Like, it's like, uh, it's a little bit like being a surgeon. Sometimes you're like, but I love those five lines in that scene. Great. Those five lines most likely can go anywhere. They probably don't need to be in that scene. So maybe just take the scene out, put those five lines in your little gem box and like, at a time where you need a, a, a levity or a piece of humor, maybe that's one that comes back in. Typically with humor, I find that too with um, when I was younger and I'm working with young, um, emerging writers, I find that sometimes they're trying to really deal with the tone. So they feel like a joke should go here and they're all great jokes. It's just that um, they can always be removed and they can always go somewhere else. Just because you lose one there, it, 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 it doesn't, you know, it's not really going to mess with anything. What happens is if there are too many beats, and there are too many jokes, and we get away too much from the story and what characters are trying to do. And again, you can do that as long as you know, as, as long as you know, as the writer know, they are after something, there's subtext here, I get what it is. You could even write in the beat, beat, she knows, but he doesn't, right? Give the actors an indication there's something more at play here. And sometimes you have to do that. A lot of the times I have to do that in my work because there's stuff underneath that is going to come out 10 pages later. But I know when a literary manager is reading it, they're like, what the, what? Oh, they just seem like they're talking. And so I, I got that note a few times on and then I got a stronger as a writer. I was like, no, this is a really good scene. It's just that they aren't, they're reading it moment to moment. They want to be in it. And so I figured out some tricks to do that. Um, a little bit sooner, but ultimately you, you are being hard on yourself because you're trying to say, are they right? Like, is, is, is there something at bay in the scene that we're going to, if there are too many beats, like I was saying a little bit earlier, it dilutes it. Um, you can have a great director, a great actor, they can mend it, they can make it really good, but sometimes it, it gets a little, we get away from why we were there in the first place. Sometimes that might be a technique you want. Maybe you want the audience to feel that way. That's totally great. You can do anything you want. It's just a matter of the effect. What are you looking for 
for the audience to feel. Um, and I wouldn't even know that stuff until a first draft because I'd be messing around a lot with how it works and, and the scene work. And I think part of the fun is discovering that. Um, workshops help because when you're working with a director and actor, and again, we are living this crazy time. So when I say a workshop, at this point, it would be digital. It would be getting together on Zoom, um, different techniques and ways to do it internally and in also showing. New platforms are out there. Um, there's a lot of opportunity. Um, we know we're going to get back together in a room, but it may not be technically to to work the way it used to work at the, until summer or in, or fall. So I think just mentally understanding, I can still write and do my work. I can still workshop. The reason why workshopping is helpful, and actually as writers, we are we are really fortunate because the work we can do uh, around a table is a lot of talking. <laughs> So it's not bad to have a meeting format because a lot of the things are like you having a discussion where the director's like, yeah, but in the scene, I don't like really get what they're going after, but she really wants this apple. And that's like, well, she never says that. Well, there's all these hints in these seeds. And then I pay it off on, on, on scene seven. It's like, oh, you did, but I totally missed that. Do you want that the audience to really know that? And you're like, yeah. Do you think you can lean into that more? Maybe I can. Maybe you can, maybe you can't, maybe you like it, maybe you don't. But through those discussions and you articulating and talking out loud about your intentions as a writer, it's going to be helpful because either you'll defend it and you won't change it because, but through defending it, you'll understand it. You will realize you actually are, it actually isn't in there the way you thought because we, we go through a lot in our heads, <laughs> right? The whole plan, yeah. it's all Amadeus. It's oh, here. Yeah. It's here. So everything we're trying to do is about these, these beats, these like in these different, like a comic book format is similar to plays, but it's different and uses techniques a little differently, but they're similar. So I think that's all we're trying to do. And that's why um, uh, we all have literary ability, but that's why really anyone can be a writer because the truth is like in our thoughts and our identities, we're structuring stories and we're structuring ways to communicate. Um, and there are different things that can be informed by, by learning and, and, and taking classes and education and, uh, and innate talent, which maybe you don't even need any of those things. But the truth is that we are writing when we think. And so we're trying to harness that into um, a different ways to, to work in the ways we want them to. And for, for the folks who are on this call right now are all at varying stages with their writing. Yep. But for those folks who are kind of ready to be at this point of, you know, getting into a room, a virtual room right. with a uh, fellow artists, I have a two prompt question for you. One, who are the, the artists they should be asking? And two, how should they go about asking them in this current moment? Okay, that's terrific. Uh, yeah, I think this is an interesting time of, so the first answer is go to the inner circle, meaning the people, the, the person you really trust, the person uh, that is an artist you really trust. And so <laughs> I'll give an example. It seems like a little mean, but like uh, if your sister isn't a writer and she's just like your really good friend, uh, but she doesn't read a lot and she doesn't go to a lot of plays and she doesn't like, maybe, maybe you save your sister for a different kind of support. Um, and I just show that as a quick example, because I think of one playwriting class, someone was like, but this isn't, and I cut this and I cut that line. That wasn't, and I was like, whoa, 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 what's going on? Who's giving this information? She was like, my sister. I was like, is your sister, like, does she go to the, does she, what's happening? And they're like, no, but she just gave me this information. So one of the things that I'm really obsessed with, with feedback and support and mentoring or menteeing and is who is this person? Because it's not like, you know, you don't go up to a random stranger on the street or even like, again, like if, has your sister written 10 plays? Like, I, you know, I don't know. Is this helpful? I don't know. Like, like, but I think who's giving at your sister would be great, or in that scenario, when the play is produced, absolutely. Or at, at a reading, you know, that's helpful because you're gonna give all the elements and then the sister's the audience member, right? But when we're talking about creating and working on pages, this takes people that are in, that have, that know how to do this and are trying to do it. So I think you're looking for someone uh, that gets you, supports you, thinks you're interested or, or sees a nugget in you that they're excited by or, um, but also, hopefully is a little um, more advanced than you or has something that you're like, oh, you're envious of even like, oh, they do that thing really well or that would be really cool to, to get their thoughts on that so that they can kind of fill in a dimension of you or challenge you in a way. Um, 
or a, or a collaborator or someone like that. And I would go to them first and say, can I share these with you? Or I'm thinking of creating this kind of world, or I want to create a reading. Um, I think one of the hardest things for playwrights that I've heard about is getting to know directors. And it's really, I think, because I started out in a playwriting group called Youngblood, that access happened naturally and then built from there. So I was constantly around directors. And I'm finding, though, that um, that playwrights now, especially even coming out of, out of an MFA program, because sometimes they were kept pretty um, separate, uh, bizarrely enough, that they're in this situation where that's a little more difficult. So I would, so I would say, if you don't know a director, that's fine. Ask the actor you really respect that's your friend. Ask the fellow writer that's a really good friend. And um, in terms of directors, yes, keep a list. Keep looking at people working and like, oh, I like that person. They did that. Oh, I think they'd be good for my work, okay? And like start to think about that. And then see if any of those things cross up. Does that actor know that person that you think would be great? Does the actor read something? Does the director come to mind? Um, and in working with directors, you really don't need them probably right away. You need the actors first and you to kind of work through, hear it, develop your own process, get it under your belt a bit. And then you can have a director in to um, direct by Zoom. I've actually seen some great readings now directed by Zoom. I'm in a 29 hour workshop and that's the first time I've seen actors like, like uh, do a reading, so to speak. And I was like, oh my God, this is really good. But it was also really good because like, they had rehearsal, like I'd never been, like I'd been, when we teach, we're playwrights reading each other pages. We're great, we're awesome, but we're not acting it. We're not, we don't have intention. We didn't go through every line. We're seeing it for the first time. And so I, I saw this reading um, and I was like really floored. I was like, oh my God, because in a weird way, the head is closer. I don't have to worry about a music stand. There's no awkward physicality. So, you know, if you have some rehearsal time, it really does help by Zoom because then you can get to see something with clear intention. Uh, we're doing this a certain way now, but the way you would do is the person talking would go into the center. Um, similar to this, anyone listening, we wouldn't see. Um, uh, but there's many other ways to do it as well. So I think that having a director in, hearing it, or, or directing some of the scenes and seeing how they work and, and, and discovery is very, very helpful. And I think there's just a lot we could put together. Great, it works virtually this way. Cool, how would it work live? And you might have to talk about some of those things, but I don't think it should impair, like I don't think anyone should be frightened that, uh-oh, because I work this way, when I come, when I'm in a theater in September, it's gonna suck. That's not true. Great dialogue, great moments and beats. That's why we go to readings, right? The reading is the same thing. We're imagining it all, right? So it's the same thing. It's just that we're not at music stands. And honestly, sometimes music stands can be annoying. So yeah, they sometimes they don't work. So, you know, just like the technical glitches here. So it's like, if you're ever like, oh no, this computer's not working. Be like, okay, the music stand fell apart. That's what happened. Or the binder fell apart. It can the floor. happen in the real room. It can happen in the <laughs> real room, baby. It can happen. I've been, I've been there, although this was college students where like they flipped in the binder and it wasn't musical. So then move around. And now all of a sudden we're on page 20. We just skipped five numbers. Who, who cares? This story, there's no story here. Um, we don't need a story. We don't need that. <laughs> so, um, how would you recommend that folks reach out to these collaborators? Absolutely. Okay. So this is an interesting time where when it first started, we actually all kind of, first of all, there's like really interesting things in terms of time. Uh, we are connected in a way we have never been connected before. It is... I've never experienced anything like it myself. I have to be quite honest. We're seeing uh, like the top ADs, top associates, struggling going through their own issues with their nonprofit, and which is incredible, yet being um, available, vocal, sharing, uh, you know, on social media, they, they're very honest. Like you're seeing a side of them you haven't set, seen before. Like, and they, and you're seeing why they do it. I guess right now it's just everyone's so naked and raw. You're seeing why everybody does everything because there, mm -hmm. there's really no pretense. Not that there was a pretense before, but I think everyone was super busy um, in physical time running around. And I think um, you just didn't see as much of that. Um, and for good or bad, we're on social media a lot. And a part of my exercises will address that because I'm realizing today that that was getting in my way a bit. Um, so I think that's really great. The other thing though, is that we're now super busy. So in a different way, you know, uh, we filled in all that time, we filled in that commute time, and then there's grief. There's times of grieving. There's, you know, that's why I say these task lists and when you write and what you accomplish. Again, if it's one or two things in your writing, that's freaking awesome. If it's one thing that like, great, you're, then tomorrow you're not sure if you can write, it's a very small thing, then you'll go into the next day, terrific. Cause you're gonna, it's gonna be sporadic. So I think when you, when you talk to people, just realize that they're busy. And just, and the first thing you want to do is you want to say, how are you? 
That's the number one thing. Number one thing is the relationship and saying, how are you? Um, I, I'm not sure what your time looks like right now, or it, you're, you know, you may be booked with some virtual projects or with family. Um, I am hearing something new. I know it's a crazy time. Uh, it's just getting me through this time. I really appreciate it if either you could hear it or see it. And, and if this is something we talk about more in the months to come, totally amazing. Please let me know how you are, you know, because, because again, it's more about the human thing. And I think recognizing that, you know, everybody has, has, you know, things to do. And, and especially with actors, if it's not paid, be very, very, very kind, be like insanely kind because for the actor, I mean, it sucks for the writers too, but I will say this writers own their IP. So it sucks right now, but let's say like the plays get done again, or there's a commission. I mean, like, you know, I'm still mourning about the things that I just got rejected from, but ultimately I can make something and that's something I own and that I can get royalties from, or I can have filmed or, you know, when everyone's a part of it, sure. But ultimately, uh, so the, but actors are in service in most cases, unless they've co-created it, are in service of the work. And so when that work went away, they don't have a salary. They don't have a leg to stand on and every extra thing they do, you know, it's a, it's a big choice because this time needs to be used well um, because it's a weird time. Um, and I will say this too, because people may not know this. I didn't know this. Um, they're being asked to um, do casting videos in a very aggressive way. Um, so meaning like it took less time before, like you'd go in for your slot. So now they're creating virtual content that is private to win things basically. And that takes time and care and to do it right and stress. Um, now, so, so that's just to prepare you for, you're gonna get some, so number one, don't be frightened because you're also gonna get help people. So some people will be like, like crying and then like they're gonna get your email and it's gonna change their day. It's gonna make them, even if they just felt loved to be asked, it's gonna be helpful. You reaching out to them is gonna be helpful no matter what. And they're gonna be excited to hear that you're doing something too. So um, the, uh, so, and some will come back right away and say, I'm, I'm in it. I don't care if there's no money. I would love to spend eight hours working with you on this thing. That'd be freaking awesome. And then some will be like, oh man, that's, I wish I could, but you know, I've got to do this uh, 29 hour <laughs> reading that Crystal made me do or whatever they're booked for or whatever the thing is like, and you're like, oh, cool. You know, um, and that's great. But again, these connections last, right? And so they, they always go towards the future as well. Um, I, th I just think that's really important. So I, th I think this is a this is a time of collaboration and connection, um, and creation. I, that's why I think the lunch times are really cool. I hope that helps. It's kind of long. It totally helps. Okay. So yeah, make sure you ask people how they are and focus on the the human behind the screen, which can be hard. I apologize. There's a there's an alarm mm -hmm. going off uh, oh, okay, outside, but um. Okay, it's gone now. But I think that's uh, that was our sign that it's time to jump into some writing. Okay, great, perfect, um, terrific. So these will be timed, and um, and I will be in charge of the time. And if you are uh, want to know about the time, you can just uh, kind of look at me because uh, I'll you know I'll give you like a two and a one like um, or or I'll write in the chat here. Okay, so um, but the first thing we're gonna start with. Um, accepting where we are and, and before we get into our work. So these are the techniques some people are talking about writing today and the stresses. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna write down a list of everything that is stressing you out. I, I have no doubt that um, this will be fruitful. Uh, it's a, called a free writing list. So you put pen to paper, just type, you know, like again, it's for you, spelling mistakes can be there. Uh, don't worry if they're full sentences, uh, it's just so you can read it. It. Uh, but I'm going to give you three minutes and the list is things that are stressing you out. But again, today has a, a lot of past in it as well. So whatever comes out. And your timer starts now.
Great. Okay, great. So, um, whew, I have no doubt your list was long and expansive and not quite done yet. We can always return to it. That's great. But it's out there, which is great. So I'm going to lead you for a, through a little bit of a visualization exercise before we get into the next writing um, prompt. So I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to be in that reality right now, the reality that surrounds you, that was swirling around your list. Um, which again, you're going to share after this. And I think you'll find it very healing um, that many of your things on your list are going to be different perspectives on similar things. But go ahead and close your eyes and just be in that reality right now, whatever you hear outside your window, whatever you smell, the five senses around you um, in that stress, in that reality, it is around you right now. Um, but you're not driven by it, but you're in it. You're just sitting in it for right now. Um, and whatever the realities of the day are that you're feeling, and now what's gonna happen is that I'm going to, not unlike a surgeon, I'm going to be going inside and each of those stresses, each of those realities that you know surround you might be kind of in your body, I'm gonna take them one by one and I'm taking them out, like pulling out a thread. So I'm pulling it out, one piece of stress or reality that is difficult and I've let it go. So whatever that is, I'm not sure, but it's gone now. I'm going to do another one. So I'm, I'm reaching in. I've got it. Maybe a really tough one. And I'm taking it and I'm throwing it out the window. It's gone. So that's gone too. Now I'm going to get like three of them. Whatever the, those next top three are. And I'm releasing them from you. I've pulled them out and that's stressed. And I'm going to gather up the rest of them. And we're just going to let them float to the sky. So in you right now, those things are not there. Um, you are just you in your own space, in who you are. You're free of those things. And in being free of those things, I'd love to you to write a list. Um, I call it the why today list, but it's gonna be a list of um, why you write, why you create, why you get up every day and try again. 
And so it's a list of why today. I'm going to check in in three minutes. These um, uh, are best in the form of a question. Kind of like Jeopardy. Um, so the questions that you're exploring, you know, um, I, I write to discover why people are um, uh, unkind to each other in a, in a, in a difficult time. Um, I write to question authority when it's misused in power. Um, you know, anything could be, sometimes these end up being quite political and quite big. And sometimes, again, they're very personal and small. Like, you know, why do some roommates not listen to, uh, to their other uh, roommates? Why, do, why does this happen? You know, it can be small, it can be big. I know that everything's kind of big right now, but we still don't have to worry about the equation of things. But um, your timer starts now. So go ahead and write all of those things, all of those things that drive you to, to write or things that you're questioning in your work or that drive you, things that you're passionate about, the questions you want to seek answers to. Might be answers through your work, might be answers in your life. What it is that's driving you. Great. 30 seconds. Great. And um, when you can, find a stopping place for now. And I'm going to ask you uh, three questions. And I'll check in with you at two minutes. They are 
they're meaty questions, um, but quick questions. So here's the first question. The first question is, who were you yesterday? As you might guess, the second question is going to be, who are you today? Who are you tomorrow? And go ahead and answer those questions to the best of your ability. Remember, this is a list just for you. This is just you speaking to yourself. This is not about speaking to other people or proving anything to anybody else. This is about your honest conversation with yourself about your feelings. So if there are big dreams that feel, oh, that's so big and intense, and you, and that comes from a deep desire of who you are or what you want or what you feel, then write that down because that's true. Truth is our own connection with our reality. Who were you yesterday? Who are you today? Who are you tomorrow? These are the great kind of questions too you don't get graded on. These are the best kind of questions. <laughs> You're the only one who would grade yourself. And we're going to put an extra one in there. Who is the virtual you? You must remember in this time that up until uh, <laughs> 30 days ago, we had an open conversation about how being online too much was actually destructive. <laughs> So we are now using tools in a new way that we have to and it's finding new beautiful things to the virtual world. But the virtual you and you are not exactly the same. And it's important to understand that that's not a bad thing. Even if it's the slightest difference, I just want you to be aware of that. And I want you to keep, look back at how you've answered these other questions because it's okay to have a little bit of the different you. You may not post every bad thing that happened in your day. You may, um, or you may post only the bad things that happened in your day. Whatever that is, that's just one side of you. And, it's, and you had to basically write it. So it became fiction. You wrote it down, you put in a photo, it became something else, right? Just wanna make sure that we stay in touch with that. That's you in the virtual world and the way you work and who you are. But there's also the you that, that could even be private and be anything it wants to be and doesn't have to be, um, seen uh, virtually. And that is the real you. And it's okay if there's a slight difference there. It's okay. What we care more about today is, is the, the person inside. When we do marketing, we're gonna access the virtual you, but we're not doing marketing right now, we're just writing. Yes, because we need something to market. Um, excellent. So maybe, uh, let's see, 30 more seconds. Great. So now that we've connected with that, we're completely in our own space. We're able to think about things fictionally and understand their value. We understand that they have just as much value as the air we breathe. We don't have to negotiate. We don't have to think, oh, geez, is writing in this time okay or not? It is okay because we're here. It is okay because we're being ourselves and we're able to connect with ourselves and however we're feeling right now. So now here's the exercise 
Um, and uh, it's going to be a simile monologue exercise. So first I'm going to tell you a little bit about how that works and then I'll give you um, the little twist on it. Um, uh, I don't know if you've noticed this, but um, we are more honest with each other when we use similes or we're able to empathize more or understand each other. If someone says I'm sad, um, it may not affect our hearts as much if we say I'm, I'm so sad I feel like I'm drowning um, in an ocean and the waves are pulling me down. And as they pull me down, I can barely hear my own voice and the sand is, is clogging um, every orifice. Um, and all I can think about is how much I would like to be in your arms again, right? This is a quick example of the simile monologue and how it works. What's gonna happen is a character compares in a state of high emotion, how they feel to a simile, right? And similes, of course, are images, they're nature, they're um, uh, like they can even be famous people or they're, you know, um, I feel like Han Solo and Kryptonite. I've been feeling like that a lot lately. Um, so um, now this is how you're gonna come up with the simile that's gonna be exclaimed. This, this is a monologue. The monologue is said by the you today. The you today is exclaiming the simile and trying to make um, the other person understand how they feel through the simile. So you always want to keep coming back to the imagery like I did there with the sea. Um, and of course, we use similes every day, like, you know, I see my heart explodes like the 4th of July, right? Like we use these things all the time. They're around us all the time. I get so mad at you, I feel like a balloon that could pop, right? All these things. But this is the you to, of today. You are speaking to the you from 30 days ago. The you before the social distancing, before you, Broadway went dark, before they said you couldn't come into your job, the time when you knew there was a pandemic, but you did not understand how it would affect, even if you thought that, the, the severity and, and the quickness in which it came um, was surprising to us all. So this is the you from now, speaking in, in the state of emotion that you feel like you, that you would speak from in a simile, to the you from the past, that recent past. And what do you wanna say? What do you wanna say about how you feel or what do you want that person from the past to understand? Uh, I will give an option here if someone would rather do a person from uh, the future, the future you, that either is possible. You could speak to the, the you from 30 days ago or you could speak to the you from the, uh, in the near future. Either is, is possible, but the person speaking is you now. And what are the simile? How would you compare um, the state of emotion? Uh, it could be the state of emotion you're in. You could also like heightened it, of course, uh, because this we're getting out feelings, but this is fiction and, you, and it can go um, any which way you like. I'm gonna check in in, uh, we're gonna check in in four minutes. See where you are, okay? Uh, this may not be super long. It might be five sentences, it might be seven sentences, it depends. Uh, but it will be meaty, I promise you. Um, if the other person tries to speak, you could give them a line if you want, but the, it's almost like a rant. The, the you from now is, is speaking so intensely and needs to, to have that stick, that talking stick. Um, they may not let the other person talk. Okay, um, great. Your timer starts now. The first step is to get down that simile, get down, get, get the emotion and get how the person is, how you are comparing yourself and what, and, and see that other character, that other you um, that is being spoken to. And then let it all come from there.
Great. In the next minute, so I'll write it down. But you kind of look at finishing this off uh, and even if there's more you want to write, you can always return to it and it's something you can keep working on. Um, but um, the, it might end with a stage direction of how the other you is looking um, at the present you. I want you to feel in your body what it feels like to get all of that out. Um, is there something you learned or discovered? Um, is that helpful in some way, not just in the fiction, but maybe also looking at the kind of things you want to write and why you want to write. Um, the, last, the last thing I want to leave you with so that um, as you kind of go forward, you can share these monologues. They're very powerful. Um, there's something about this trick that I have yet to not hear, even if it, it gets weird. Sometimes the similes get a little weird and it's, it's great. I've heard ones about, you know, I feel like a reflection in a mirror and then you go into the mirror with the person and it's like unpredictable and interesting. So um, I think it will lead to, to fruitful things to share. Um, I, I wanna leave you with one final thing in terms of thinking about a larger project you might be working on so that then you can take it forward in the next hour over your lunch. And so this is a, a quick visualization so I want to, um, actually, we don't even need to do the visualization. We'll just do um, like for two minutes. I want you to write a list of all the new play ideas you have that you're excited about. All the plays are, are things you want to write. Just a list of things you want to write, things you're excited to write. Um, don't worry about if it's accomplishable or not. Don't worry about, if, oh, that was the idea I had in fifth grade. If it's still there and it's something... But it should be things that you're excited about, not things you feel like you have to, or you, you know, please, no, don't write down that two person play that your agent tells you to do because you have to do it. No, it needs to be something you're really excited about that you want to do from you, authentically from you. So, um, so what, what is that list? Get them all out. Don't censor yourself. Don't worry if it's too much. It's like this whole basket, this basket of, we all, as writers, we have a never ending basket of things that we're interested in writing or um, pieces in our head or something we're excited to do. Uh, could also include um, a play that you've been working on but haven't quite cracked yet. Um, in, in times like this, these are the times that make us see things in different ways. And sometimes something you couldn't solve in a play um, will become more apparent and clear to you. Uh, let's see, 50 seconds left for this list. Oh, well, now I lied, now 40 seconds. Yeah, 45 seconds, oh, Kelly updated, perfect. So in the next few seconds, um, see, I know you writers, I know you have more to go on that list. We always have a million ideas. I love it. Okay, don't worry, I'm not gonna leave you hanging. I'm gonna take you through the next part. 
I want you, and you got to be really honest with yourself. I know you want to write every single thing. I want you to like, um, I often talk about this moment in the Dark Crystal, the original Dark Crystal, and I love the series. It's so good. It's, it's, it's the anti of the family drama, yet it involves family, but there are guilt links, so it's so much more exciting. But um, uh, what was I going to say? There's a moment in the original Dark Crystal where the Gelfling puppet Jen uh, picks three shards. He's not sure which one is going to fit in the crystal and he plays a little flute and one uh, uh, shines brighter than the other. So uh, the first step of this is to look honestly at your list and what are the three that in your lifetime are incredibly important? As of today, could ship tomorrow, could do the list tomorrow, could be another three. That's okay, that's totally cool. But what are the three and if you're like, oh shit, I didn't put that other one on the list and put it on the list now. But what are the three? The three, the three very important ones. It does not mean that the other ones will not get written. Sometimes they end up going in, in the three, actually, or things merge. But let's just worry about those three for now. Those top three. You just go ahead and circle them. And then we're gonna find the one. So after you have the three, I want you to pick the one. The one that maybe you feel like for the purposes of this, and I am making it specific to this, you can do this on your own in a very different way. Like if you had a whole year, you might say, okay, what's the one? But let's look at the one that like, might be fun for you to discuss with your collaborator, your friends and your, the people you're gonna meet in, in, over lunch. The one that you think during this time might be cool to tackle or interesting or helpful, you know? And so when we think of this time, again, I don't want you to think of time like tomorrow or in 30 days, right? let's you can plan for your future even if it's not specific so let's say the summer so whatever you pick is something that you might be interested in messing around with right now and working on over the summer which which one is it you know sometimes it's if it's an angels in america like idea and you feel like that's great i want to tackle some of it, that's awesome i feel like ooh, that's a little overwhelming i maybe i am going to go for this two-person scene. Not the one the agent told you to do. It's great if the agent told you to do it and you wanted to do it, that's totally cool. But if just the agent told you to do it and you don't want to do it, do not pick that. And hopefully that's not on your list. Um, so again, because you've got to be passionate. It's got to be something you want to do. Um, and I think it's also helpful to remind yourself, what's the one that's the most me? What's the one that most is who I am? Um, and I think that's helpful. And if all three feel that way, that's cool. Then you have like a, a challenge. But pick the one um, because you should share, you can share your simile monologues, you can share your idea. And I think I love pitching. I think pitching is helpful. It's fun. And when I say pitching, I mean all stages of pitching. And so this is a kind of pitching. You're not pitching because the person you're having lunch with is going to tell you whether or not you can write your project. Absolutely not. Um, you're pitching in the way like you're talking about it out loud. You're taking out a little golden bauble and you're saying, look at this. Isn't this interesting? You know, I've thought about doing this can you hold this? How, what do you think? You know, isn't that cool? You don't have to ask, what do you think? But he's like, you know, and that's cool. Uh, what's your bauble? What's your idea? So I think you can start to kind of um, share and dream on some of these ideas you have. Um, I think then Kelly usually has, um, uh, leaves with a challenge. So I say by the end of your lunch, the challenge would be, what are the three things I would say, what's your goal by the time you've, and this would be after you shared your simile monologues and after you shared your idea, by the end of the lunch, and Kelly can, can leave this with you in the last 10 minutes, I think you wanna look at um, what is the goal with that idea. Now, if you're halfway through the lunch, you're like, oh, I wanted to pick the second idea. That's okay, so okay. The police will not come and take you away. You are in charge of your own life. That's totally cool. Like, or you might have a new idea that pops into your mind. Absolutely, the re revising is excellent. Um, but what Kelly's gonna lead you through is like, what's the uh, objective with that? Meaning like over the summer, is it to write the first draft? Is it to write it as a short play and then explore as a full length later? But the first, the goal is the short play. Is it a scene? Is it a monologue? Is it three songs from it? Like whatever, just make it really specific. Okay, and again, when we say work on it, we mean really we're talking about three to four months, right? So we're not stressing about, oh, I gotta do this in 30 days. I leave the interwebs to take care of that for you. You want to write something in 30 days, a day, 24 hours, pick a contest. They're out there right now. You do any of them. So I'm talking more about like you for your, your own life, your own, whether or not, no matter what stage we're in. Um, uh, so, so again, what is the, the first thing you're going to do is what's the, the goal um, that you think you can accomplish over like three or four months. And then I want you to write three specific things you're going to do to achieve that goal. 
So you're going to leave here with a, like a task list. And if you want to go even a little further, you might not get here on this, but you could look at those three specific things and give them a date. Give yourself extra time. And, and, and sometimes you will get it within the week. Sometimes you'll get it within two weeks of it, but it helps. And sometimes they shift and that's great too, but it helps you start to, again, be in control of what you're going to do. Now, what could the three steps be? They could be write the draft or write a scene from it. Awesome. It could be then outreach to a, a, a director. There's five people you've been talking to, but you've never really had a Zoom coffee with anyone or like talk or shared pages. Great. Or maybe an actor friend or you know, share it with Sarah or something like that, or like someone like here that you feel comfortable with, like, you know, and the third part might be like, great, I'm going to do a Zoom reading of um, whatever I have and maybe give the challenge of at least 30 minutes or, you know, or 20. And then you're like, oh shit, I have 45 minutes. <laughs> so like, you know, again, these are all malleable. They just help you um, start to get specific and then the dream um, can live. Um, I hope that's helpful. So that's, so there's a lot of fun stuff that you guys can talk about and do. I'm going to, I've got some pasta. So I'm going to have some pasta. Um, Kelly, is there any final questions or, or thoughts or is anyone have any outstanding things? Do any of the writers need anything else? Do you think? Uh, if anyone needs anything, send a message. I feel very taken care of <laughs> personally. Um, where does Crystal teach? Well, she teaches at ESPA. And I she do. also teaches. Where else do you teach, Crystal? Um, I teach. And... I teach at Pace University, and um, and what's great is that with ESPA, we're talking about several. Um, there's always the first draft class that I do, or I do sometimes a second draft class. Um, but I think I'll be back on first draft. But um, um there's going to be a few special workshops, not in similar to what we did here, that address kind of the times we're in and how to create work, um, uh, but different aspects of that. So like weekend workshops, and um, I'm also doing. Uh, a whole pitching thing we might do to help with coming up with log lines and treatments and ideas and um, and how to share and communicate about your work. Um, but several things like that that we're gonna, uh, so I would say that primary stages would be the place to, to look to for me to teach. I will say too that there's another opportunity to uh, work with me. We might use some of these techniques in full disclosure, but I, I'm always adding to my bag of tricks. It's gonna be April 22nd at 4 p.m. at, uh, at HowlRound. Um, that might change a little bit, but it seems locked in and it's like a live stream where I will be leading through exercises and it'll also be about writing in the pandemic um, uh, and writing from shock. Um, uh, but I probably will do some different things. And that's, that's free and on the HowlRound, the HowlRound TV. Wonderful. Yeah. People are writing in saying this was incredible, great presentation oh. and exercises and I couldn't agree more. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Crystal. Thank you and enjoy your time. Um, uh, remember that you've already done the hard work today. Enjoy from here. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us and enjoy your pasta. I will, okay. I'll see you guys soon. <laughs> Bye, Bye, Crystal. Here we go. Here's the challenge that Crystal is sending us all into the world with. So the three things, three things. One, what's your goal with that idea that you circled? What's the objective of it over the next three to four months? For example, do you wanna write a full length, a scene, a monologue, three songs of a bigger piece, three standalone songs? Uh, what is the objective of that? The second thing is after you have those, that objective, number two is write three specific things you're going to achieve with that goal. So that might be, Step one, write a draft. Step two, reach out to a director or actor friend. Step three, do a Zoom reading. So we have what is your goal with the idea and then make three specific things you're going to achieve with that. The third thing that Crystal has left us with is to add a date to those three specific things you're going to do. So that's just setting some deadlines for yourself. So we have what's the goal, what's your objective over the next three to four months, the bigger picture. What are the three specific things you want to achieve? And then setting some dates for that. I have a few messages here, so I'm just gonna check those. Um, whoever was in uh, the group that wanted to keep each other's emails, you can stay on the line and we'll just have you exchange those emails. Um, but other than that, that's all I have for you today. Uh, keep an eye on your email. 
I'll be popping by to your inbox. And uh, thank you, thank you, thank you for having lunch with us. Have a great rest of your day, all.